you so much for coming out, and thank you for this movie. Thank you to uh, United Artists for Leasing and MGM for making this movie possible. And act in the film, or how did you how did you get started on the project? I got started on the project when I listened to the script over a decade before we made it, and uh, um, it, there was immediately, I think, by page thirty, I had. Dylan's face imprinted on on that role, and, and, and really in a unique way. And um, and I was at, at, at that time asked if I could give him the opportunity to direct, act, or do both. And I never thought that I would want to direct myself. You know, the, the directing such a, 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 a for me such a, a joy to do. Why would I want to do something that's not always a joy to, <laughs> to do? Uh, when I got the job. Um, but as time went by, you know, every film has its own journey, every script, and to the point where it's finally made. At first, she was just very reluctant about doing it. She, and she can speak to the reasons for that. Um, and of course, I was not, you know, inclined to push it. But I was not able to conceive of the movie without her in it at that point. And so um, I, we just, you know, told the people who, who control the rights, like, thank you, but you should go make the, the movie. And then, you know, finally, all these years later, uh, she felt ready to do it, and we did it. And oh, and I didn't answer your question, so yeah, it, 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 I was going to do it with her and an actor playing her father. And what happened was just sort of a fluke. Um, something came up in the actor's life personally and was not, had to drop out a month before shooting. And um, it wasn't easy to offer anybody no money to jump from whatever their life is and their jobs are and start shooting in a month. So I kind of had to do it. I'm so glad that that happened because what a great opportunity to be able to do, the, do that part of the job with her too. Was it true you were reluctant initially to do it, and, and what? Why were you reluctant, and what brought you around? Yeah, I mean, the first time he um, approached me with the project, I was like 15 or 16, and I read the book and I loved the book *Slim Slim Man*, which is what Five Days based off of. And um, but I, I actually thought that he wanted me to read it because he wanted to wanted me to help cast it. And I actually remember thinking, like, Kristen Stewart or Dakota Fanning would be so great for this role of Jennifer. And then he asked me to do it, and I, and I just, um, acting was something I never wanted to do. And I always wanted to be in the industry, but always thought I would be behind the camera, which is something that I still aspire to do. But, um, yeah, it was a pretty solid no fucking way <laughs> at 16. Um, and then, Almost 15 years later, I'm 30 now, so I was like 27, 28 when I came back to me and there was this other actor attached, he was gonna direct, and I just felt like, what an amazing role. Like, it's, it was just something I felt like I could pass up, and um, I felt like I had gained experience from my own life that I could refer to in terms of coloring the character of Jennifer. And then especially after meeting her, it just felt like, uh, what, a, what a privilege to tell this story. And, um, and then, you know, he had to sign on as the actor, and that was also really, I mean, it was like, I think 30 days before yeah. shooting. Yeah. So it was a real adjustment. And honestly, my mom was the real one to be like, that, you know, we've had our differences, but working with your dad was the best experience I've ever had as an actor. You should do it. So I did. Amazing. <laughs> it's incredible to hear the, both of your stories there. I mean, having just seen the film and seeing you two together and how fully you embody both of those parts and the chemistry you have. And I was thinking about, you know, in music, there's that term, uh, blood harmony, when family members or siblings sing together. And you guys, it's, love harmony on the screen there. I mean, that your, that your scenes together are just so electric. Um, so, and this was your first time working together, 
right? So, and then she came together 30 days before shooting. That's crazy. So, Sean, I'm curious to hear your experience with that. Like, and both, two of your kids are in the film. So, um, can you just talk about that? Like, I mean, as an actor, as a director, and as a father, what? Yeah, I would know. The like. way I can put it in, 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 briefly is that I'm an insomniac, but I sleep well when my kids are close. <laughs> and you know, and in in my day to day life, they visit quite frequently, and we see each other. But um, having them trapped close to me while making this movie <laughs> was. Uh, I think the stresses of acting and directing, because I'm not really built for multitasking. I do it, <laughs> and it stresses me out a lot. And, and, I, and a lot of other aspects of my life, I do it, but I really like to make the movie experience as pleasurable as possible for the actors. And, uh, and I think that it would have not been a good time in life to, to, to be anywhere too, too long away know and just uh, missing them so that was great the other thing that was great about working with Dan is that and in particular Dylan because she is the movie um, I, I didn't ever have to negotiate the, the ego politics of the two actors you know I could I could say okay I feel I've served what I need to serve it, and I should be in second position because it's Jennifer's story. And so as soon as I felt after you know a couple takes, okay, I, mean, I could focus all my attention on covering Jennifer and covering Dylan as Jennifer. And so that actually was, a, I hadn't considered how much energy goes into navigating two egos. Uh, uh, until I had an opportunity not to. <laughs> One of the things that struck me um, watching it tonight was how it, it feels that's just the strongest through line in every scene that the two of you have together where you, you just want to tell the truth, you just want them to come clean. Like you're there kind of with open arms and an open heart, but you just want him to drop the facade and it's kind of continues the whole time, maybe until the end when you're like really becoming a journalist and pulling away a bit. But um, could you talk about how you found that kind of the emotional through line of this for you? And um... I mean, I think it really helped talking to Jennifer. Um, we spent quite a bit of time together, and I think that what was so amazing to me about her is that she has this or had this amazing ability to forgive her father after he passed. Um, and I think that is one of the strongest things that human beings can do. Um, so I felt like, I mean, I guess to really get back to your question, it's, I feel so lucky that I have a transparent relationship with both of my parents. But I think there is a certain point where you feel, especially as you get older, that some things weren't told as complete truths, and you just need to know what the baseline is. And with her, it was so different. I mean, she was blatantly lied to for most of her life by a father that completely and wholeheartedly loved her. So that's a really confusing thing. Um, I mean, I guess I've had that with other relationships, so I, I think I drew from that a little bit, but, but really it was just talking to her and hearing her speak about, in such a, a vulnerable way, about those times that he lied to her and knowing that he was lying. And, and also um, being so strong as a teenager to confront him and, and still not get that truth in return, which is, I think, you know, why she went to journalism because that is a true seeker's job. Yeah. Sean, were you able to, um, would, in researching John, was it basically off the book, or was there footage of him, or? No, I mean, interpretively, my, my, my first contact with this project was Jez Butterworth's screenplay. And it had landed so strongly on me, and he had worked very closely with Jennifer, so I knew that I could, um, that I was pre-licensed
license for the, the whatever poetic license he had taken. Then I read her book, which is so beautiful, so beautifully written, and, and because I, I'm a bit of a, a music and narration dependent director, I think, and, and I like that kind of um, uh, style. I guess style's not my favorite word, but something whatever that is. I, I, I've loved m movies that are, you know, full of music and and, uh, and, and narration. Well done. And I was able to. So in the, that moment where I was revising the script, because at some point as a director you have to kind of bring it home to you, and not rewriting it. But in this case, the writing was so good. I, I, all I did is look for scenes that I could do visually, or do with music or songs as an additional character, and so I was able to reduce things to, to, to that way. But in terms of the choices about John Vogel, I, I felt very connected to it from the first read, uh, from the from that that point of view. Before I knew a tremendous amount about the, the real uh, fella, so this is more from the script as licensed by Jennifer Vogel. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pretty practiced in this answer, so I think I'll, I'll get it done fast and clear. <laughs> I had had such an extraordinary experience with Eddie Vedder on Into the Wild. Uh, and in, in, that, in that case, you know, he was, I would be in the editing room and I would get these files of songs in and I would take what I was using as temp out and replace and it was just one exciting moment he just got. You know. And so, I don't think I can read a script anymore without first thinking, oh, I'm going to see you know, if, if Eddie's part of this, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and if he will be. So, but I also, I, in this case, I needed a female voice. I didn't approach this the same way as in the wild, where it was consistently one voice. Uh, but I had been so enamored of movies like The Graduate and and, 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 and Harold Maude and, and others that use songs in such a, you know, a, a, a beautiful way. And so, knowing we would ultimately be, because there was to be reflected, was also John, so male voices could come in, but dominantly female. And so I asked Ed, basically, if he could kind of curate this thing. And, and he brought in Glenn Hansard, and they started writing songs, and then we were t looking for who would be the right female voice. And I was listening to every great singer anybody's ever heard of, and every great singer nobody's ever heard of, <laughs> while studying the script. So I'd have the music playing, and and like I say, when I read that script, I saw Dylan's face, and, and there was that, her emotional nature, I couldn't find the voice that represented it. So I called her. And I said, who should I listen to? And her first answer was Cat Power. Uh, and I had not heard Cat Power before. And I was so excited by it. It was, felt just right. And Eddie had worked with her before. So then that happened. And the three of them wrote and performed songs. And then right at the very end, you may or may not know that that, that end title song is Eddie Vedder's 16-year-old daughter singing that song. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, let me ask the production. Did you did the film shoot before the pandemic, and then you were doing posts during? Or yeah, we ran right up to the the line. Uh, I, I I cut at at my house. I was little cutting a little uh, in the backyard. Uh, you know, we were doing that. Myself and the editor, you know, the masks and the, the doors open, you know, before the shutdown, and just trying to be, and then it just became clear that this was going to be a really serious problem, and we were nearly locked, 
So I, and she is Icelandic and had been away from her family throughout the shooting and then into the post-production. Um, is is, is a, a, an older woman and was, we were all concerned she would not be able to get back because Iceland may, may quote, would have locked it, you know, close off or whatever. And they had shot the flights, might shut down. So I had what I would call housekeeping to do. And I, I would be able to do that with an assistant editor and, and you know, just little changes that I wanted to make by then. And that, that editor, who's brilliant, is Valdis Oskadotter, who had done um, the Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind and did some, some other things with Gus Van Sant, was the one. So, and so it was a unique experience for me because I'd never worked with anyone but Jay Cassidy, who was not available. And, uh, and so in this case, I'm not just not working with Jay, I'm working with a woman, and she's not American, and it's a very American story, and it was so great what she brought to it. You know, she showed me things that were surprising and so on. And then I locked it up with an assistant, and you know, presumably we were a lot to move. But because of COVID, um, I got involved in other things and we wanted to hold out so that we could have a period of exclusivity in theatrical distribution. So, yeah, so, and, and, and fortunately, MGM was willing to do that. It, it, but but they, that's it, it, after, afterwards, by the time. So in all those months where I was thinking about anything but the movie, it really got me fresh, and I watched it again, and I thought, gosh, you know, I'd really like to go back in with this little bit. <laughs> and, um, and I had just seen Queen's Gambit. And Michelle Tesoro, who cut that, was available and wanted to do this. And I said, let's take a look at that. So I, had, I ended up with these two brilliant female editors and, and had this, the, 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 the benefit of some, some time to just step away from it. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, I do want to ask a question that does not to do with the movie, but the other stuff you were working on during COVID. I'm just, but I'm curious how it relates to the film. I mean, your organization, CORE, has been. <laughs> I mean, we work internationally, but in LA, the work that CORE has done throughout the pandemic is monumental and initially without any government support. And I, like, how did you? might be a crazy question to ask, but how did you balance that with finishing a feature film? Like, I don't know how you... Uh... Oh, well, I, well, I didn't. I mean, um, I, you know, we, we shut down on, we locked the movie. And, uh, um, and, and, and going back into it, this last story, was also only a, partly because I had producers that were, A, willing to, to, to try to see if we were gonna get theatrical distribution, to not just sell it off the stream, and I'm sure, had I made this movie with Warner Brothers, this movie would have come out a year ago, uh, and, and, you know, but only streaming, right? right? So, you know, what I thought would have been nice, which is a one-stop shop and not have to go through all the meetings with all the different financiers that you puzzle these together, I, you know, turned out to be the biggest blessing because we had a lot of people with a limited investment, and so they were all willing to take the chance. And um, I don't know what the original call was. So, so, so I hit block. And then it was a complete and total shift of gears. And I, like I said, I did not think about the movie for months as we started this, you know, initially the testing and then the vaccination. Um, and then, you know, it was after, because I have a, an awfully good team. And so after, I, I'm a door kicker and, you know, have a couple good ideas in the beginning of this stuff, but it's built by the team. And so once things were up and running, I could mostly only get in the way. And I was able to start thinking about the movie again. Yeah. Wow. Um, Dylan, um, I'd love to hear more from you just about your experience. Like, once you were in production, um, did, you, did you grow up going on set with your father and like seeing him in that creative work environment? Or was this, what was it like for you once you were like, fully making the film and, and working together in that way. Yeah, I mean, it's very different uh, from just being a guest on set. Um, I did grow up going, going on set with both my parents and 
Um, I was asked this earlier today, like, how much fun was that growing up on set? It's like so boring. <laughs> and really, even as an actor, like, you're, he said this before, like, your job is hurry up and wait. It's waiting to do the job, you know, that you get paid for. Um, so yeah, so I never, even though I, I as I said earlier, like, I was always interested in being in the industry. Um, I, I guess like watching him on set was not something that particularly interested me. Um, I definitely, I was a bit older, like 15-ish, 14, when he made it into the wild. And um, I really loved that story as well. So watching him um, direct, and also I was madly in love with Emil Hersha at 14. <laughs> so that was an easy, like, let me come into the editing room, please. <laughs> Um, and I and I did notice him as a director, and that was initially what I, what made me aspire to want to be in the industry behind the camera. Um, but working with him is a completely different experience. Um, as a director, um, he's so unbelievably focused, and like he just said, he kicks doors down. He does that with everything he's passionate about. So even though this was an independent film and we were very limited financially, nothing uh, in, uh, stopped him from fully, um, you know, uh, uh, he never was unable to complete his vision, no matter what it was. So as someone that wants to direct, that was something that really inspired me. And then as an actor, I was nervous because we've never worked together and I think in any profession, um, you don't know if working with your family is gonna be a great thing or a disaster. And I was just nervous because I just didn't know. I knew, I know he's a great actor, I know he's a force, but as soon as we sat down, the Chinese restaurant was the first scene we shot together. And um, as soon as they called action, I felt like, oh, this is gonna be so much fun. Because he gives so much. So it's really a gift to play opposite him. Um, and it just, I think because we are close, that lent itself to the film. Um, also, a relationship with the father is complicated no matter what. So I think you can see that as well. Um, but, um, but I really, honestly just had, had so much fun playing with him as an actor. Yeah, I mean, that really comes through. There's so many different colors. That, I love that scene where there's, I mean, there's the, there's, there's humor, there's unexpected humor, there's like you, you, that kind of tenacity that you, the way you keep asking questions, the way the drug conversation goes. I mean, it's really, um, it, it's so rich. Uh, it looks, it, it looks fun. So Danny Motor is the DP, and Danny and I were neighbors. Um, and many years ago, uh, I, he, I, I had seen several of the things that he'd shot, and most of the work that he'd done was for television. And what was being asked of him seemed not to be exploiting his biggest talent, because he was doing side films of his own that were really adventurous and beautiful. Uh, and, he, and so I, we, there was another movie year, several years ago that I was briefly preparing and that, that Danny and I decided to work together the first time then. And then that movie was another one of these situations where I got, I got very connected to one actor that I wanted and I couldn't make that situation work and so I didn't want to do it anymore. So we, that, that didn't happen. And then as soon as I had you know, another movie to make, I, I called Danny and I was, it, it, aside from the, what I think is the beautiful work that he did, he was a real brother in arms in the sense that because I was acting and directing, you know, when something was too, when I could always look and trust his instincts about things. So yeah, that was a, a real, uh, 
I made a very good choice there. <laughs> Danny Morgan. Oh, yeah, right here. What? Last question. What was the decision behind using the garage? Behind, I'm sorry? The garage. Uh, well, that, that was in the original script. Jo uh, John Vogel, also, in, in, in reality, was quite a, um, an artist, um, which I think certainly led to his uh, abilities <laughs> and, and girl. Um, and you know, it's interesting, the, the, the drawings that were John Vogel's drawings were for the film done by his other daughter, there was a, 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 a he has another daughter um, that, for what reasons of her own, didn't want to be portrayed in the in the in the uh, film uh, version of this. So uh, and so, but she had a hand, I guess, very similar to her dad's, and so she came in and did those drawings for us. Actually, I do have one last question. Your hair in this movie is so amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you get out of jail. But there, you have a new, numerous good haircuts in this movie. I'm like, I think the best is yeah. when you see him, when he shows up with that paper, and he's got the head on the side, the kind of rooster thing, it's amazing. Yes, it's not a question. Hey, well, yeah, yeah, what I, I, I do have a response to, which is in the same, in the nature that I am a, 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 a narration and music dependent director, I'm definitely a hair actor. <laughs> <laughs> Sean and Dylan, thank you so much. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.